Hey guys, this is Josh here with Trillium Wild Edibles, and today I want to bring you all a video on 9 obscure wild plants that you might find while you're out and about foraging. Some of these plants are edible, some of them are medicinal, and one of them is poisonous. I will delineate that whenever we get to the section on each specific plant, but I figured this video would be an easy way to bring my three videos on obscure wild plants all together into one resource to make it a little bit easier to find the information on these plants. So, with that out of the way, let's jump right into it. Now, the plant that I'm holding right here in my hand is called the Asiatic Dayflower. There are a lot of dayflower species, and there are also a plant called spiderwort that will look very similar. All of these plants, dayflowers and spiderworts, are in the same family, and they have a lot of similar uses. The plant that we're looking at, Asiatic Dayflower, is an alien plant. It comes from Asia, hence its common name. This plant is invasive, however, I also have noticed that it doesn't necessarily overtake a lot of other plants in the area. So, right now we're looking at the Asiatic Dayflower, and we can tell this in a couple of different ways. One, it has indigo colored flowers, petals, just like we can see right here. There are technically three petals on this flower, though you might be questioning, well Josh, there's only two that I can see. You're absolutely correct. There are two that we can see, however, if we look at the bottom, underneath of the stamens, which are these yellow flower looking things coming out of the center, we're going to notice this white or translucent clear flower petal at the very bottom. However, the top two petals are somewhat ear shaped, or they're shaped a lot like a violet leaf without the cleft at the back. So these uh, flower petals have a heart shape to them, and they are blue or purplish indigo in color. The stamens or pistils are extremely prominent on this plant as we can notice here. If we look at the end of each one of these stamens we're going to notice this yellow flower looking thing coming out and this is where the pollen is inside of the plant. This is how pollinators get inside of this plant and spread its pollen. This is one of the parts of this plant's reproductive strategy. So that is a good way to identify an Asiatic day flower. Some other really interesting features about the Asiatic day flower, if we look at the leaves and the stems, something that we're going to notice as we look down the stem, at each leaf petiole there's going to be this little sheath running down the main stem of the day flower plant. One of the reasons it has the name day flower is because the plants will only bloom once out of the whole season. They bloom for one day and one day only. And there are usually a lot of plants because this is a colonizing plant. So whenever you find one, you're probably going to be finding a whole lot more. And if we continue down the stem, we're going to notice this alternating leaf pattern with these little sheaths everywhere there, are, there is a leaf node. So if we continue down the stem, we're going to notice this alternating leaf pattern going down the stem with this little bitty sheath right here at each one of the axles or each one of the leaf nodes. The leaves of Asiatic Dayflower have an oval or ovate shape to them. Some might even interpret them as lance shaped, depending on the style of lance points that you're used to seeing. The leaf edges or the leaf margins are smooth, just like we can see on this species right here. You're going to notice one very prominent leaf vein running from the center all the way towards the very tip of the leaf with the rest of the veins running very small, but also parallel to this main vein in the center. This is an extremely easy plant to identify, and it's also very commonly found around homes, around barns, and even around gardens. I very rarely will see this plant in the wild, especially in native environments where there's a lot of native plants. However, it can be found there. Wherever you do find this plant, keep in mind that it is alien and it is an invasive plant. However, it doesn't always take over native flora, so that's something to keep in mind, that it may not always be destructive where you're at. If we look very closely at each one of the leaves on the Asiatic Dayflower, we're going to notice how they clasp the stem. These are clasping ovate shaped leaves, and that's because they are stuck to the stem. There is no real leaf petiole or leaf stem that attaches them to the main stem of the plant. However, there is this sheath with this clasping leaf structure on this alternate growth form that we have. Now if we look right here, we're going to notice this old dead bloom, and that's because this flower 
blooms once every day. So an interesting thing to keep in mind is that just because you see a flower on the same day flower doesn't mean that it won't flower again. I have noticed that there will usually be multiple sets of flowers running up the plant that will continue to flower. This plant flowers anywhere from May all the way through October. And we are right now at about the first week of September where I'm at. And this plant is still in flower. Okay, now the next plant that we're going to be talking about today is called chufa. This is a type of grass or a species of grass. Now chufa is really interesting because it's now becoming extremely popular within health foods and within those who are wanting alternative foods and alternative medicines. This plant is extremely prolific in a lot of different states and it's also grown commercially now for deer and turkey and also for human consumption. Another interesting name for the edible tuber of this plant is called the tiger nut. Tiger nut or chufa is used to make milk. It's extremely nutritious. It is chock full of calcium and vitamin D and this is an extremely healthy plant that if you do find it. It's very distinct and right now this plant is in flower slash seeding stage. So we can see these terminal spikes coming up here with all these unique little spikes, these brownish green spikes sticking out. They're radiating outwards in somewhat of a circle. We can also notice that there are branches here and here and here that allow these terminal clusters to produce. Chufa being a species of grass is very common and there are multiple species of chufa or tiger nut. This plant is really popular in Mexico and India and even some places in Europe and it's starting to gain in popularity within the United States. Some stores like your Whole Foods and places like that will sell tiger nuts. Not only as the nuts themselves but also tiger nut milk. So if you find anything labeled tiger nut this is the plant that they're gathering them from. This plant produces edible tubers, which are basically like small little potatoes. They're not really potatoes, but they are similar because a potato is a tuber. So this plant produces edible tubers that are within the ground. And the harvest time would generally be right before the very first frost. Another interesting feature about chufa or tiger nut is the main stem of the plant. So let's take a look at the main stem of the plant and see what makes it so unique. Okay, so now that we've gone down to the main stem of the chufa, what makes it so unique? The fact that it is triangular in shape. It's not square and it's not round. It's not ribbed or anything. It is a triangle in shape. Okay, after taking another chufa stem that's growing here on my property, I have quite a bit of it here. Anywhere you find chufa, you're probably going to be finding a lot of it. However, if we take one of the stems and cut them in a cross section, and we look at that cross section like we are now, we're going to notice this triangular shape. This is unique to Chufa, and I don't know of any other plant in the United States that has a triangular stem. There might be other plants with triangular stems that I'm just not aware of, so make sure you keep that in mind. However, this shows you guys that it does have a triangular stem, and this is a good way to identify Chufa grass. The leaves of chufa are a yellowish green and they will generally grow on opposite sides after the plant has come to its stem and its flowering stage like we see with this plant right here. The leaves are very long and grass-like, like I said they're a yellowish green and they will also have this deep channel or canal running through the main center which is one of the main veins of the leaves. Now you guys might remember that triangular shape of the main stem and what's interesting also about chufa is not only does its flower stem or seed stem have that triangular shape, the main base of the grass or the plant is very stiff and it's also triangular in shape, just like we can see on this chufa right here in front of us. Another one of the nice things about chufa, especially this time of year, is how it's very easily discernible from everything else because of that distinct flower and seed spike that it produces. This plant is usually easily noticed from a distance because of this distinct spike that it has. Okay, now the third and final plant that we're going to be talking about today is called clearweed. Now this plant is very easily confused with nettle and a lot of people will call it a false nettle. However, it isn't the true false nettle. It is related to nettles and it is in the nettle family. However, it is not an urtica species because it does not contain urticating hairs. 
as we can tell by the top of the leaves, they do look very similar to wood nettle and stinging nettle. However, it is not a nettle plant. It is in the nettle family and a nettle species, but it does not contain any of those urticating or stinging hairs like the rest of the nettles. The leaves of clearweed are broad and ovate with very, very strong teeth running along. Ugh. The leaves of clearweed are very broad and ovate. They come to a very fine point or a tip, just like we can see here by my thumb. The edges, the edges or the margins of the leaf are very, very sharply toothed, like we can see following the edges of the margins of all these leaves here. The teeth along the margins of these leaves is very easily discerned from the rest of the surrounding vegetation because of how sharp and how distinct they really are. We're also going to notice three main parallel running veins from the petiole all the way down to the tip or the very termination of the leaf with all these different little veins running across. And this is how the plant will transport its nutrients from the soil up into the leaves for its photosynthesis and for its growth. Clearweed gets its name from its clear and translucent appearance to the main stem of the plant. And this is also interesting because this plant is not only translucent, but it's extremely juicy throughout the main stem. This plant is not poisonous in any way. It is edible. However, it does not taste near as good as wood nettle or stinging nettle. Its leaves will grow in an opposite pattern all the way up the stem, just like we can see here. And in each one of the axles or the leaf nodes, we're going to notice more leaves coming out. And we're also going to notice anther, A-N-T-H-E-R, anther-like flowers coming out of these axles or out of the leaf nodes. This is a really good way to determine whether you have a clear weed just simply by looking at the stem. You're also going to notice, as we can see here, this groove running up or this channel or canal running up the main stem of the plant. However, see how below and above we don't see that channel. If we turn the plant over, we're going to notice that channel on the opposite side. This channel will generally change sides of the stem as we go from leaf node to leaf node. And then once you get further and further down towards the bottom of the plant, you're going to notice that channel becomes somewhat absent. But as we get further up the plant, that channel will become more and more distinct and it will alternate on sides of the stem. So the groove or the channel running up the main stem of clearweed is alternate, whereas the leaves are opposite. On this plant right here, you guys might notice these little white specks. This has nothing to do with the plant itself except for the fact that this is a species of aphid. For some reason, I have aphids growing along this clear weed and along several of the others. I guess this plant is really sweet so that way the aphids are able to get a lot of sweet sucrose and glucose to allow them to produce their honeydew. This is not a main feature of this plant, however it is something to keep in mind because I generally do find aphids on clear weed. So if you have a garden and you don't want aphids and you find this plant, make sure you do get rid of it so you don't have aphids spreading to your domestic crops because that would be horrendous and cause you a lot of problems as you're trying to grow. If we look at another clearweed plant in my yard that doesn't have aphids on it, you're going to notice this very thick green foliage coming out of the axles of the plant. And that's because this plant has green flowers, and this is normally the time of year this plant flowers. They do not look like normal flowers. However, they look somewhat fern or evergreen-like, you know, kind of like an evergreen tree, like a juniper or a cedar. However, this is not an evergreen plant in any way, and it's not an evergreen-related plant. Clearweed will often grow in big patches and colonies. As we can see right here, there are a whole lot of clearweed plants right here. We have some white snake root off to the side, and there's even some lobelia and flata growing within this. These clearweeds generally like more moist environments. They're growing right on the edge of my house where rain comes off of the roof, which provides them all the water that they need to survive. If we look at the top from the leaves, we're also going to notice they're very shiny, whereas your nettle plants, your true nettles, your true stinging nettles, or wood nettles will be very dull and they'll also have urticating hairs and fuzz along the leaves. Whereas clearweed does not, you can see these leaves are almost shiny and glossy in appearance. And this is another way that you can determine 
whether you're looking at clearweed or a true stinging nettle species. The very first plant that we're going to talk about is the plant that I have in my hand, and you can tell by these white flowers it looks somewhat like a daisy. However, the petals are very fine on this flower, as you can see just by looking at it. Here we can notice just how fine these flowers or these petals on this ray-like flower is. Now daisy fleabane is a very common plant and you're going to see it growing along the edges of pretty much anywhere, like the edges of your house, from the edges of fields to the edges of wood lines. This plant can even grow a little bit inside of the woods. I've seen this plant as far as 20 to 30 feet inside of the woods. Daisy fleabane will bloom in the midsummer and it will bloom all the way up until late August in some cases up until early September. However, the flower petals of daisy fleabane are very, very fine, just like we can see here. They're very fine and there is a whole lot of them and they all terminate into the center with this very yellow disc shape right there in the center of the flower. The flowers of daisy fleabane can not only be white, they can also have a slight pinkish tinge like we can see on these flowers here. They have a slight pinkish tinge. They almost look purple because of the lighting here as well. Now daisy fleabane will have multiple flowers within terminal clusters and we can see these clusters here with individual flowers running up the main stem of the plant. We can see all of these clusters of these white to pinkish white flowers that are growing and there's going to be a lot of flowers on these plants. There's never just one. Sometimes you may only see one but usually you're going to see a whole lot of them. So whenever you see these white circular splotches dotting the horizon or dotting the line of a woods or the line edge of a field, there's a good chance that it's going to be daisy fleabane. The leaves of daisy fleabane will alternate all the way up the plant. However, there can also be some opposite growing leaves on daisy fleabane as well. Now I had to pick this piece off just to be able to show you guys, but this is from towards the top of the plant, as you can tell by all these clusters of flowers towards the top. But we can see these two leaves on exact opposite sides of the stem. And this is what I mean earlier by this plant can have alternate and opposite growing leaves. Okay, now the next obscure plant that we're going to be talking about today is white snake root. Now this plant is very well known, especially from the early 18 to 1900s, for causing milk sickness within cattle. And it can still do the same thing today. Milk sickness is something that you want to avoid, and this is not a plant that you want to consume for food because this plant can kill you. Now, uh, this plant does have uses for medicine. I'm not very aware of those. Snake root can be pretty indicative that it might have been used for snake bites. However, I'm not aware because I don't use this plant. It is a plant that's well worth knowing how to identify so that way you don't make a mistake and pick it. Now, while this plant may be obscure, it is very common and whenever you find it, you're probably going to be finding a whole lot of it. This is one of the earliest flowering specimens that I have in my area, so this is the one that we're going to see today. White snake root, as its name might imply, gives you the idea that it has white flowers, just like we can see this very cluster, very nice cluster of white flowers. And from a certain perspective, these plants' flowers can actually resemble bone set flowers, and that can be extremely dangerous. However, the leaves and the rest of the plant look nothing alike bone set. But it is worth noting that this isn't bone set, even though it is a Eupatorium species, and boneset itself is a Eupatorium species as well. The flowers of white snake root will happen in these very small clusters, and in each one of these clusters, there are dozens of flowers. The flowers are extremely small. They're so small, I can barely show them on camera. You might be able to see about 15 or 20 in the dead center of the frame right now. Each one of the flowers will have five petals, and it will have these fuzzy white stamens coming out, which gives this flower this brushy or kind of fuzzy sort of appearance. However, if you look extremely close, you're going to notice five petals. The leaves of white snake root are egg-shaped with very large, somewhat sharp teeth running along the margins of the leaves. And the leaves will come to a very fine point or a very fine taper, just like we can see on this leaf right here. We move the plant from the bottom towards the top, we're going to notice leaves towards us, leaves away from us, leaves towards us, leaves away from us, etc. because they grow on opposite sides and they will always alternate in this opposite pattern. Okay, now the last plant that we're going to be talking about today is wild blue lettuce, or is it sometimes known by its other common name, bitter lettuce. And one of the reasons it has the name bitter lettuce is because this plant is a little more bitter than normal wild lettuce that has a yellow flower. 
There are a lot of varieties of wild lettuce or lactuca species across the United States and across the globe. All of them can be used interchangeably for food and medicine, and I've done a few videos on how to use wild lettuce. So we're not going to talk about the uses of this plant in this video today. Blue lettuce is called blue lettuce because of its very blue flowers that it has right here. These are sort of light and kind of whitish blue in color, but they do have a blue tinge just like you can see here. There's going to be a lot of petals on the flower just like we can see on this plant in front of us. Sometimes you may find anywhere from 7 to 10, sometimes you may, fa sometimes you may find as much as 15 petals on each individual flower. In the background here we can see all of these little flower buds and these are from flowers that have opened or are getting ready to open. Each flower bud will bloom at a different time and this is a really good example with this brown guy that seems to want to run for my hand. This pod that we have with this brown tip coming out is one that's already flowered and that's why we see this brown is because that's what's left over from this very beautiful flower. Now the leaves of blue lettuce are very distinct and highly variable all at the same time. One thing you're going to notice is that they're usually somewhat simple as they grow up the plant with very, very fine teeth just like we can see on this guy right here. Very sharply serrated with these fine teeth along the margins of this leaf. However, as we go down the plant and look at the larger leaves towards the bottom, we're going to notice these very distinct lobes. And now the blue lettuce leaves can actually look a lot like dandelion leaves. The only difference is that they're going to be much larger than dandelion leaves will ever grow. Wild blue lettuce will grow in a basal rosette form at first, and then it will grow upwards. And as it grows upwards, those basal rosette leaves that have the lobes are going to be up top on the stem, just like this one here, and they're going to be up off of the ground. And then as we go up the plant, we're going to notice these very long and elongate, somewhat lance-shaped leaves with teeth along the margins without the lobes. As you go up the plant, there are less and less lobes on each leaf, and they get more simple and more lance-shaped. Another thing you're going to notice about wild blue lettuce is that its leaves will alternate all the way up the stem. In each node, you're going to notice these small little round buds, and flowers can come out of the node, out of each node, all the way up the stem. So this plant can produce a lot of flowers, and it can produce a lot of seeds. Pennsylvania Smartweed. And this is in the Polygonum family, and there are a whole lot of plants in the Polygonum family. There are over 900 Polygonum species within the United States alone. So there can be a lot of variety, and these plants hybridize very easily with each other. There is another Polygonum species that looks similar in flower structure. However, its leaf structure is completely different. This plant has a very beautiful elongated cluster of pink to white flowers, and they can be white as you can see here. Flowers themselves will grow in this huge elongate cluster with a whole lot of flowers. If we look very closely at the flowers, we can see they look almost like little peas. They're, they look closed off. They appear to be closed off, and that's just the look that this flower has. Now right there we can see an insect trying to do his job. That's awesome to see, and we can also see the stem rising up through this elongated cluster. We can see that green stem through the elongated cluster of pink to white flowers. Now sometimes these flowers can appear purple, and there are a whole lot of variations within the flower colors themselves. So if we look around the area where we find these flowers, we're probably going to be finding a whole lot of them. And you may think that what makes this plant obscure if it grows in such large quantities? The fact that not many people really know what this plant is, that's what makes this plant obscure. As you can see, this plant forms these large mats and these large colonies. And this is very, as you can see, this plant forms these large colonies of the smartweed. And this is very typical of polygonum species. It's very well known that polygonums, like Japanese knotweed, for example, can be horribly invasive. The leaves of Pennsylvania smartweed are very simple in their structure. They're ovate to lance shaped with smooth margins and they come to this very fine point, just like we can see right here. If we look along the sides or the margins of the leaves, we're going to notice that they are smooth without teeth. The underside of the leaves of Pennsylvania smartweed are a dull grayish white in color. They don't have any other distinct features. They don't have any distinct feels or hairs or anything of that nature but they are this dull grayish white in appearance. The leaves, will grow, the leaves of Pennsylvania smartweed will grow up the stem in an alternating pattern, 
And another interesting feature that you're going to notice if we look closely at the nodes, if we look at the nodes of each plant, we're going to notice this small sheath on each node where the leaves are coming out of the main stem of the plant. And now this is a very common feature on multiple smartweeds and especially lady's thumb, which is another polygonum or a smartweed species that a lot of people are going to notice. Now if we look very up close and personal at the sheath in between the nodes where the new leaves are starting, we're going to notice these little frond-like hairs that are coming out of the sheath. And that is a distinct feature of this plant. As we follow the stem of Pennsylvania smartweed down at each node past the sheath, we're going to notice a slight crook or a bend in the stem. Just like we can see on this plant right here turned at this side angle. Another thing we're going to notice about the stem of this plant is that it's brownish red or rust red in color and appearance. Okay, now the next plant that we're going to be talking about today is called Virginia knotweed. Now, something you might notice in the trend in this video is every plant has weed in the last part of its common name. Ironically enough, the only one that is a true invasive weed that can be a real problem is Pennsylvania smartweed. Virginia knotweed is another polygonum species that's native to the United States, and it has this very long, very, very long spike of these white flowers. And the flowers, as you're going to notice, will alternate up this very long stem or spike that the plant has. If we look closely at these flowers, we're going to notice that they are white and they appear to again be closed off. However, these have this very distinct spike towards the very bottom of the flower, just like we can see right here. And we're going to notice this on each one of the flowers going all the way up the spike on Virginia knotweed. The leaves of Virginia knotweed are very simple. They're broad and ovate and they come to a very fine or sharp point just like we can see on this one right here. The tip of this leaf is extremely sharp, not sharp enough to cut obviously because it's a leaf, but it is very fine and sharp at its tip. And we're going to notice this on each one of the leaves just like we can see here. The vein structure of the leaf is very parallel if we follow the petiole of the stem all the way up the leaf and we can see these main veins running off to the side in this parallel form, i.e. you're going to be seeing a vein on one side and one exactly on the opposite side of the leaf and they're going to curve upwards. If we look upon the sides or the margins of these leaves, we are going to notice that they are absolutely smooth, there are no teeth and there are no lobes. So this is a very simple leaf and structure. Just like most polygonum species, if we follow up the stem, we're going to notice an alternate leafing structure, and at each node, we're also going to notice a sheath, just like we can see on these nodes right here, where you can see this very brown, almost woody-like substrate coming out of each sheath. And here you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about with the sheath out the leaf nodes where this brown woody stumps it, where this brown woody substance comes out of the sheath. And this is a unique feature to this polygonum species specifically. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. When it comes to the long elongated flower spike of Virginia knotweed, it can be extremely long all the way up to three or four feet long. I usually only find it about one to three feet in my area and very rarely do I find it over three feet long. However, this gives you guys a good idea because here's the base of the knotweed plant and then here we can see this long spike coming all the way up. Okay, now the last plant that we're going to be talking about today is called ironweed. And ironweed is really easily noticeable by its very distinct maroonish pink flowers that it has right here. And these flowers have kind of a bristly appearance or kind of a fuzzy appearance, especially if we turn them at the side or at a silhouette angle just like this. Now there are a lot of different species of iron weeds and these species, these plants hybridize very easily with each other. So discerning one from another is not really necessary, mainly because they're all supposedly usable in the same ways. However, we're not going to talk about the uses of this plant. We are going to talk about what it looks like a little bit here. Ironweed is a really common plant that's found around the edges of rich fields and the edges of rich wood lines. It can be found along the side of your property, along the back of your property, anywhere you have a tree line growing, this plant can grow. I usually find it mixed in with thistles and Queen Anne's lace and even yarrow and things of that nature. So that gives you an idea of the area that this plant usually does grow in. If we take a very close look at the flowers of ironweed, we're going to notice not only this distinct color that it has, 
but we can notice all of the individual flowers on this globular sort of flower cluster that ironweed has. And there are dozens of flowers within each one of these, and the pistils or stamens of each flower are going to come out and give it this sort of bristly or brushy appearance. The leaves of ironweed are very elongate, and they have a lance shape all the way down the leaf. They are extremely long. Here is my hand for a good comparison, so you can see just how long these leaves really are. If we look very closely upon the margins or the sides of the leaves, we're going to notice these very fine teeth, very sharp serrated edges running down the margins or the sides of each leaf. The leaves themselves have a very stiff and papery or cardboard kind of like feel. They feel like very, very rough construction paper in your hands. The leaves of ironweed will generally alternate up the stem, just like we can see here. However, there are going to be a few exceptions, with some leaves being oppositely placed of each other. We can see a little stink bug there curling along, that's cool. As we're following the leaves down on ironweed on the stem, we're also going to notice this very dingy or rust brown color that the stem has to it. Now the stem can be purplish dingy or it can be rusted brown like we're seeing here. There are some purple tinges, especially on the petioles or the leaf stems. And then here on the main stem of the plant, we can see this dingy rust brown sort of color to it. Okay, so there are nine obscure wild plants that you guys might find while you're out foraging. I hope this video has helped give you guys something extra to do and occupy some of your time while you're under the lockdown. And I also hope this video has helped you guys learn more about some of the obscure plants you might find while you're out and about in the woods foraging. I thank all of you guys for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next one. Stay tuned.